Good afternoon to you all and welcome to the webinar entitled Hybrid and Virtual Learning Spaces, prepared for um, the Open Education Week uh, by the Eden Network. Uh, please allow me to uh, briefly introduce myself and my colleagues and then invite them, each of them actually, to say a few words about themselves. My name is Nicoleta Laura Popa, and I'm coming from um, the University of Yash, Romania. And the presenters or the panelists today are Francois Le Cellier from the University of Poitiers, Johannes Müller from the University of Cologne, and Vanessa Vigano from the University of Montpellier. All the four of us are members um, of uh, the Education Innovation Working Group of the Coimbra Group. Few words about the Coimbra Group. Uh, most of uh, you colleagues in the audience probably know it, but it's our duty to uh, present it briefly. Um, the Coimbra Group is uh, an association of long established universities um, according to uh, the Coimbra Group website today, we are 41 universities member of the, of the Coimbra Group. And uh, this is a very rich uh, cooperation platform in terms of uh, education, research, but also um, in our relation to uh, the communities and the societies. Uh, the Education Innovation Working Group includes um, a bit more than 30 members who are nominated by um, universities which are a part of the Coimbra Group. This being said, I would ask uh, each of my colleagues to introduce uh, herself or himself. Maybe we can start with Vanessa. That's the order on my screen. Okay, thank you, Nicoleta. Yes, I'm Vanessa Vigano. I work at the University of Montpellier as a digital educationalist, and I mainly work uh, with the European Alliance and European University Charm EU that I'm going to present today. So my tasks actually are uh, to uh, support teaching staff uh, in getting geeker, uh, more geek, <laughs> in uh, uh, realizing hybrid classroom at the University of Montpellier, where we can have um, different uh, methods of teaching and learning experiences. Uh, uh, Johannes, sorry. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Johannes Müller from the University of Cologne. I'm heading the Department International Science at the University of Cologne, and I'm also uh, a trained historian, and I, as such, I do teach um, a history in a program that is called the Global Study Program at the University of Cologne. Part of my department is also um, digital internationalization, and that's uh, something I'd like to share with you today. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, and Francois? Hello, everyone. I'm Francois Le Cellier from the University the University of Poitiers in France, and I'm associate professor in computer science, specialized in image and data analysis. So I'm kind of specialized into things like learning analytics and how to help students to use digital platforms. And in my classes, I teach also project management. Well, that will be what I will present today. Great, thank you. I will just uh, try to share with you in uh, the few in, in few moments, few slides in order to provide you a framework of the level of our discussion and debates in the Education Innovation Group of the Coimbra Group on learning spaces um, and learning environments, because uh, the proposal of uh, this webinar actually builds on the work of uh, education innovation group members for the last five to six years. And I think it's important to um, have a bigger framework uh, before presenting uh, at least three case studies uh, produced by uh, colleagues from the, from the group. So uh, basically, uh, we started uh, the discussion 
um, some five to six years ago, as I, as I mentioned, but everything turned a bit differently uh, during the last two years. Uh, as a two, side, uh, two sides effect of, uh, of course, the pandemic emergency remote teaching that we all experienced as, as teachers, and also as a result of the transnational teaching and learning initiatives, which flourished uh, mainly due to the European University alliances. Uh, most of the European University alliances promote uh, transnational teaching and therefore um, are pressed to increasingly plan, design and assess uh, hybrid and virtual learning spaces. Uh, the very first um, results of the work done uh, in the Education Innovation Working Group uh, on le learning spaces and learning environments uh, have been presented during uh, a well-known event, the, Co the Coimbra Group High-Level Seminar on Education Policy, which had exactly uh, or all, almost uh, a similar title, which was organized uh, at the initiative of the University of Uppsala in November 2022. Uh, in total, I think that we have been uh, presenting um, up to 20 uh, case studies of physical, hybrid and virtual learning spaces in a walkabout session, which, is, which was highly uh, interactive. Uh, you will see today uh, some of the presentations, of course, uh, adjusted and enriched um, in order to provide you more details about uh, current practices in planning, using and assessing hybrid and virtual uh, learning spaces. Few words about the way we define hybrid learning spaces and also virtual learning spaces. So therefore, so that we have a common ground for our discussion today. Uh, recently, AI, uh, AL and Gil proposed a threefold evolving perspective on hybrid learning spaces, mentioning uh, hybrid as blended. And this is the most uh, basic and the common understanding of hybrid. Um, then uh, as a space of merging interactions in which mobile technology allows transformations in the classroom dynamics, but also enriches the learning space itself. And uh, the third and the last one is hybrid as fluid, um, meaning that the border in between physical and digital spaces are totally blurred and students' motivation is actually placed at the center of the um, educational interactions. Virtual learning spaces are most probably associated to online learning spaces supported by all sorts of web platforms uh, and they allow rich uh, interactions both synchronous and asynchronous and of course cover among uh, uh, more than uh, I, I could um, mentioned on the slide uh, facilities like content management, personalized curriculum mapping and planning, um, teacher assessment, and uh, but also self and peer assessment and everything that has to do with learners engagement and administration, communication and uh, collaboration. And uh, in the last, especially in the last two to three years, real-time communication uh, through video or audio conferencing. Of course, new concepts uh, always arise in, um, in the field of uh, digital and open education. And of course, we have this competing concept of post-digital learning spaces that could include both hybrid and virtual uh, learning spaces. Uh, and this is a clear sign that we need to accommodate multiple interpretations of learning spaces beyond the the buildings and the, the physical classrooms uh, themselves. Uh, in Uppsala, we proposed um, a transition from learning spaces to learning environments, just to acknowledge that learning environments means a bit more than the space itself. Um, it means also taking into account the contexts in which we teach and we learn. 
and also all the factors that may influence teaching and learning, social, cultural, institution, institutional, and also individual factors. Of course, classroom cl climate uh, has to be considered uh, when discussing about learning environments, and this is largely based on the quality uh, of the inter uh, interpersonal interactions uh, in either physical, hybrid, or virtual uh, learning spaces. Of course, formal and informal learning environments are equally important for um, effective students learning, and we uh, considered in uh, throughout uh, the, the the five years that we worked on on learning spaces, uh, the uh, the fact that we need to address both uh, lectures but also less formal uh, interactions outside uh, the formal educational activities. And we all, I think, need to acknowledge that institutional policies and uh, institutional university uh, governance structures um, highly influence the learning environments. Um, most likely, uh, especially after the pandemic, they uh, would support uh, each and every initiative for developing effective hybrid and virtual uh, learning spaces. This being said, I think that I can give the floor to the first presenter. Um, and I think that Francois uh, will be the one to present a case study based on um, his teaching experiences at the University of Poitiers. Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicoletta. I think I have shared my screen so you can see it now and I will speak about Minecraft in project management. So I will explain some example, display some of the things we have been doing at the University of Poitiers for quite a few years now, how to uh, use the video game into a, a common way to engage students and to retain the student attention. So for those who are not familiar with Minecraft, I will speak briefly about what Minecraft is, uh, just briefly. I will not go into many more details, but I think it will be enough. Then I will explain why using a video game in higher education. I will also present the advantages and the drawbacks, and I will conclude by the student's engagement and give some final remarks. So Minecraft is a sandbox video game. It's a bit like the Legos. So I think everyone know how Lego works. So it's like Legos, but only in the virtual world. The player can build, destroy, create only with the limit of his imaginations and some kind of technical <laughs> limits too. And it's also the most played game in the world. There is more than two and 2,000 uh, million of copies sold and nearly one, one, 140,000 million uh, monthly active players. So it's a very, very big game. And if you ask to almost any teenager, he knows Minecraft, he knows how to play the game. So just to show you how Minecraft works, it's like that. It's very simple in terms of designs and graphics because it's only blocks, only cubes. Those blocks, you can place it, them as you want. You can destroy them as you want. You can create almost everything you want. And that's what is also interesting that since the players, the users know quite well how to use the game, how to evolve in a 3D video game, it's easier for them also to be able to be the, the actors of their own studies. So why using a video game in higher education? And the first part is the possibility to work, in my case, with bachelor students in computer science and electrical engineering. I had to teach them how to manage projects, how to create the project, how to plan it, how to communicate, how to collaborate, how to lead a project from scratch. This is, of course, possible to do with 
for example, a computer science project, I can ask my students to create their own project, to create their own program, their own algorithm, etc., etc. But since they are first-year students, they don't have yet the skills to develop those projects. And I want to evaluate. I want to assess the possibility of those transversal skills and not only the technical ones. So if one student is not that much um, as it is with uh, computer science or with electrical engineering, it can be problematic to evaluate his work. And his work is not the reflection of the project management he has done. So Minecraft can help with all of that. Why? Just simply because the users, the students, already knew the game in general, and they can do almost everything they like. It's very easy to understand, very, very easy to set up, and also very easy to discuss, to communicate with each other by using the game. In practice, I ask students to be by a group of six and to mix between the students who knew the game and students who didn't know that well the game. Sometimes they just say, okay, I know a bit how Minecraft works, but not that much. So I put them with students that are more familiar with the game. And each group has a specific spot in the virtual world. If I took out the virtual position and I take only the construction and the game planification, it's a bit like I've given, I've given them a box of Lego and I've say, okay, you have this box and you don't, you cannot use other things that what is inside this box. It's a bit like that in the virtual world. And they have eight hours with me and one month in total to build their own creation. So every week I have two hours in class with my students and otherwise they can connect to the servers whenever they want. If they didn't want and they didn't want to go into two more uh, information or interaction with the virtual world outside of the classroom, it's also fine. And they have to first plan their work, then build what they want, and then present their work. If they do all that, I consider that they will have done almost everything that I wanted to teach them in this project management class. And in general, it works quite well. I can show you some examples of students creation. So that is the classroom I have with my students. So you see there is small spots with six computers. They can play with the computers, of course, in the classroom. And that are some example of what they have built. So a small village, uh, something like the Western America, something more fantastic with a dragon, etc. You can see the possibility of the, if I show you there, yes, oh, the size of the specific spot. So, it's quite large. They have a large amount of space and they can also dig into the, into the ground or build up in the air. So they can do, as I say, almost everything they like. When they create that, I ask them in the first what they, they were planning to create. And at the end, I compare with what was planned and what appear at the end, sometimes it's quite close, some kind, sometimes it's quite different, but in general, it works well. So what about the advantages and the drawbacks of using a video game and using Minecraft? One advantage is the first I'd say, it's that students know the game and are very familiar with. So they can do, they can work on their own, they can design almost everything they like, they don't need my help to be in the project. They need my help to help them to plan their work, to communicate with their work, but not to be in the project and to work on the technical aspects of the project. So that's what also I wanted. 
they can uh, also it also helps the students to engage and to communicate because they are on the virtual world they can communicate sometimes easier by using the chat or by discussing with each other and sometimes the students that are more familiar with the game can help students that are less familiar with but that are that is not the students that are, are the best in the technical aspects in computer science for example it's are the students that have perhaps more experience with the game and they are also learning in a different environment there are of course some drawbacks and the first one no i didn't made any mistakes in my presentation the first name the first drawback is exactly the same as the first advantage the students know the game and are very familiar with so if you knew students you know that when they are very familiar with something they try to find the limits of the game what if i go to another specific area on the virtual world and disturb a bit my uh, my colleagues what if i try to break something what if i try to overpass the limitations that the teacher has posed but in general it works well it can be sometimes complex to see each student's work because they are all in the virtual world and i cannot be up up in the virtual world and check what each student has done in the virtual world i have the logs but it's not that easy to, to use it's also time consuming to check if everything is okay in the virtual world because as i said my students can also connect outside of the classroom so sometimes outside of the classroom i had a message saying okay i have this kind of problem with my building etc etc so it can be time consuming and what also can be difficult is to have the acceptation of colleagues when I want to use the video game, because if I use the video game in classroom, it's not that easy to have the colleagues accepting that I'm not playing the video game. Students are not playing the video game. Students are learning by using the video game because it's not a serious game. It's a video game, but it's not for all, all colleagues, fortunately. How can we measure the efficiency of this dispositive, of this possibility of this uh, learning space? I can measure the student's engagement. And just for you to know, uh, I'm currently using uh, Minecraft with uh, my students and I have uh, 10 groups that are using the video game. Some are very familiar with, some are less familiar with, but I have recorded the number of actions. So the actions, it's either they put a block or they destroy a block. Each of that is one action and one only. And that are the number of actions so far after three weeks. So you can see that you had to divide by six. One group is less experience with the game. It's this one. So they have less action, but nevertheless, it's kind of high, very high. Some other groups are very, very familiar, uh, almost half a million of actions. So I expect that I will be surprised by what they will be what they will build and what I will see on the final world. But in general, it's around 100,000 or 200,000 of actions. So it's quite large and they are very, very active uh, in the classroom. I also ask them how they like the course, just how they like it. And I, I have compare, compared with a more tra traditional way to learn project management and the positive evaluation has increased of more than 36% than more traditional way. So they like so the meaning and the possibility of using Minecraft. They, I have also some feedbacks and comments. They have fun, they are motivated, they can learn with the game, they have almost total freedom, they like being autonomous. And one I quite like, because it's not that frequent, is that they have not enough time in the classroom. It's not that frequent and 
sometimes my colleagues say, but it's just because you are using Minecraft, but it's also because I am the teacher, I'm sure. And they are also acquiring new skills because their grades are improving in project management. I can evaluate the project management better. And they are also creating new projects. When, after they finished this class, they ask in general to me or to my colleagues, if they can create other projects, not on Minecraft this time, but in real world with the computer science, with the to create an electronic device or thing like that. And when I ask them to have feedback, I have more feedback on the project management skills that on technical ones, of course, because the only things I've done is to break or put blocks. So they don't need to say, okay, I put three blocks there, et cetera, et cetera. They have to say, okay, when I wanted to create that, I had to plan the specific space, I had to plan that, I had to do that, I had to discuss with the colleagues, etc. So I have feedback on the project management skills. But all that are also subjective uh, inputs. I like to have objective inputs as well. And the objective inputs can be done by measure, the measurement of visual attention using eye tracker. Just to summarize, an eye tracker can follow the gaze of students during a course, doing something. Uh, I have some glasses that I've put and I've asked the um, uh, students on the, to, to wear during the class. And I ask 14 students to wear the glasses for 30 minutes in two different courses. One is the one I present, project management in a computer science classroom and computer science tutorial in a standard classrooms. And I have identified the gaze, or the, the gaze fixation on three main areas. One is the computer or the, the paper pen. And uh, another one is the board and another one is the teacher. If I look at the head maps, we can see that they are very different. It's logical and we cannot conclude anything from the head maps, but we can see that for Minecraft, they are more focused are for computer science tutorial, which is totally normal. But if I compute the number of fixation, sorry, it's in French, but the number of fixation and the percentage of fixation on the specific area of interest during the evaluation. I have around 60% of fixation within the, the area of interest on a computer science tutorial, but more than 80% on Minecraft. So they are more focused on a specific task when they are on Minecraft than when they are on the standard classroom. So they have more visual attention and so on. So to conclude, we can see that the students are active and engaged in the classroom. Sometimes more too active because I have to give them uh, feedbacks, etc., and I have to say, okay, go a bit more slowly because you are going in every direction and you won't finish the project in time. There is also more visual attention compared to other courses and of course, the acquisition of transversal skills. So that's in general, very productive, very interesting for my students to use Minecraft. Of course, there are students in computer science and electrical engineering. They are quite familiar with the use of the computers, but I think it can be also convert for other uh, students or other children, even in uh, uh, high school, for example. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, I'm there to also to answer. Thank you, Francois. I think that uh, the general understanding is that we are going to uh, have a look on the question and answer um, tool and yeah. then try to answer all the questions at the end and even interact a bit more with colleagues in the audience. But thank you. I think it's a very inspiring uh, case study on a very specific course 
developed with a very specific uh, uh, approach, pedagogical approach. And myself, I think I have one additional question to you. I'm going to write it on the chat uh, just after I give the floor to Johannes, who will present a quite different situation for uh, developing transnational teaching and learning spaces, isn't it? Yes, that's what I'm going to do. Let me arrange my screen also for my own purpose. This should be it. Great. Um, yes, hello everybody. I want to talk about transnational joint teaching in hybridized seminar rooms and I'm doing so from a double perspective. Uh, first, from a rather institutional perspective, so what is um, the, the, the role or what could be the role and the uh, value of uh, international joint teaching with digital means uh, for an institution? And then I'd like to look at the um, concrete situation as a lecture, because I'm also doing this uh, not only as a coordinator uh, for the international office, but also as a lecturer in my own classes. And I'd like to um, simply exemplify what I'm telling you with an example, uh, with few to rather more didactical um, um, uh, issues. So uh, to start with, I'd like to introduce to the general concept and then to distinguish between maybe the two main uh, possibilities to face uh, international uh, digitally based in, uh, joint teaching. Uh, I would like to distinguish between virtual mobility as a more plain approach to it and a more sophisticated approach, which I would see with, with the term virtual exchange or with the American uh, phrase, you all know that, uh, collaborative online uh, uh, internet learning um, coil. Uh, before I give some examples from the Cologne experience and then look at a particular case study. So with view to digitally based international international teaching projects, of course, um, what we uh, learned since probably the COVID-19 emergency is that the international usage of uh, digital means in teaching offer a great opportunity for internationalizing learning programs and study offers, uh, because uh, doing it on an uh, online basis, uh, connecting Cor uh, courses or including students from, from elsewhere into an existing course uh, allows for a very easy integration also into the curricula. Uh, it creates very few recognition issues because it's an offer uh, that is either established together with a partner or it's simply an offer where people only sign up if they can use it. Um, it is of, it offers low threshold and is easily accessible and gives access also to people who otherwise maybe would not easily uh, enter an international uh, mo uh, mobility program. And of course, digitally based teaching projects are flexible and scalable. They can be done as single course elements uh, up to entire course programs from single participants to huge digital audiences. So it's all possible in the digital world. But even though that all looks very positive and very easy uh, doing, of course, didactically and also organizationally. Um, it can be very ambitious and potentially um, not only a simple add-on, but really a programmatic enrichment and an intellectual challenge. In which ways? Um, I would, talking about flexibility and scalability, I would now focus only on two cases, which are probably the most popular ones. Uh, what I would label virtual mobility is the simple mechanism to offer, uh, to open selected courses for international partners. Uh, in our case, it was only with partner universities, partner institutions. So we had a number of anyway digitally offered courses which were opened to international students. And uh, we would admit virtual exchange students into single courses. That's a very easy uh, um, uh, um, a, a very easy approach and international students are simply integrated into the learning group and into the course design, ideally also into the course design in terms of an international classroom. 
So if the lecturer is willing to do that, intercultural issues could be addressed within this international classroom. But it has to be said, such an approach, of course, is not necessarily focused on an international perspective. It is just opening a pre-existing course. And the experience is probably similar to an exchange student that comes to another university and enters a classroom and has to adapt to what he finds uh, in that situation. But virtual mobility, in that sense, is a flexible tool for international networking. It's a quick and dirty approach. You just open courses and offer them to your partner universities, but it gives, provides those students from your international partners the opportunity to join a course at your university. Um, and in doing so, you also contribute to the internationalization at home as an international classroom is established. And according to the, uh, to the, to the uh, capacity, to the ability of the lecturer, it is also uh, allowing for intercultural experiences in an internationalized learning group. But again, I have to insist, virtual mobility is not specifically designed for international exchange and for intercultural or transnational teaching and learning. And that is a distinction which I would like to uh, pick up in a second, uh, as I would consider virtual mobility an international ex uh, learning experience, but not a transnational learning experience, uh, which is far better represented in the what I would call virtual exchange approach or the collaborative online international learning approach. I um, am not very happy that the virtual exchange, the term virtual exchange is somehow um, uh, covered or used by uh, the Erasmus program. What the Erasmus virtual exchange program focuses at is mainly intercultural experiences as an integral part, integrative part of learning of, 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 um, uh, of, of courses. And it's not really reflecting the entire potential of the virtual exchange approach. What I'm talking about are courses particularly designed for the international classroom. Uh, courses which are designed and also taught by partners, by international partners, by two teachers from different um, in, uh, uh, international partners, where the organization and the preparation and the realization of the course is done in close cooperation between um, the two uh, responsible lecturers and also the cooperation and collaboration among the students from the different um, international contexts is, uh, is clearly addressed right from the beginning of the design of the course. So we are talking. I'm, I'm talking about courses which are explicitly addressing the transnational perspective and which take the most benefit out of a transnational teaching situation, um, right from the formulation of the subject of the course up to the ways interaction is organized among students and among different learning groups. Um, and this is where also the, 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 the concept of hybrid teaching comes in, because even though that is a concept that has been born in, in truly online situations, it could also mix situations of uh, on-site teaching of two different groups, which are digitally interconnected. And then in that sense, becoming a hybrid a learning situation in uh, combining uh, on-site groups in different locations through digital means. In any case, such a joint learning project, a transnational joint learning uh, uh, project is far more ambitious and demanding as the plain virtual mobility uh, approach. Um, and in that sense, from an institutional point of view, as I said, I want to combine both perspectives. From an institutional point of view, virtual exchange projects are also an, a format which uh, can help to shape sustainable corporations among international partners, as uh, the cooperation among lecturers and among students is highly enhanced and uh, also formally and institutionally um, uh, far more anchored. I, I guess Vanessa is going to tell us more about especially such projects and their place in organizing a university alliance. Uh, in any case, virtual exchange, even without an alliance behind, <laughs> is a substantial extension and enrichment of course contents and curricula. 
and it's uh, also uh, an occasion to internationalize curricula together with a partner in, a, in, in, in one discipline and uh, certainly a concept that um, can, constitu uh, can, can constitute, can establish an alternative or an additional pillar of internationalization next to mobility and exchange and physical exchange. What I wanted to stress with that introduction is um, that uh, I really see a difference between international teaching projects and transnational teaching projects. International education, as we have seen with the virtual mobility approach, is about mobility and exchange and uh, allows for an experience of difference, an immersion into a different cultural scientific perspective. But it's not to be compared with transnational education, where it is about cooperation and interaction, and where the experience of integration of an international classroom is highly more, is far more in the center um, than it is in, in a simple exchange format where people join an existing group and are not part of the initial design. So international education. I would say is rather disruptive for the individual and it's individual and singular and transnational education is rather integrative and collaborative and for a, a pluralist a multi-perspective approach to things um, and to uh, pinpoint it even even further international students also virtual international exchange students are rather visitors and guests which are hosted by a group, whereas transnational students constitute a unique international classroom in its own right. And that is the approach that we followed at the University of Cologne with our, with our Edu Venture project. And uh, the Edu Venture project, of course, highlights the VE, the virtual um, exchange, um, the two letters um, within the word. Our experience was triggered by a funding program from the German Academic Exchange Service, the EVAC program, International Virtual Academic Collaboration, which provided additional funds that allowed us to boost this initiative. And we uh, were able to, addition, to, to get funding for altogether some 25 or even 30 courses between 20, uh, the winter 2020 and the summer 2022 with uh, more than 20 partners worldwide. In all cases, it were the, we were talking about tandem taught collaborative courses, which were fully recognized and curricularly integrated uh, courses in uh, wider study programs. Um, at least 150 local students and 150 international students were involved, involved per academic year. So some 600 students altogether in these projects. Um, and it was our aim to find ways to standardize and to institutionalize transnational teaching within various faculties. Uh, I have to admit that we didn't go very far with that project at our university, unfortunately because I really think it's um, worth to become a new paradigm in teaching and to be uh, uh, enhanced and, and fostered and, and, and supported also institutionally by universities. Uh, best thing, there are almost no recognition issues whatsoever because in any case, it's two lecturers from two institutions that can agree on contents and make sure that their that the contributions of the students can be fully recognized within existing programs. There are issues with time and term incongruencies, of course, that have to be addressed. And there are also technical obstacles, as we will see in a second. But it turned out that all these limits and challenges can be overcome easily, especially the technical ones. And there's always made much fuss about uh, what the technical issues are in, in providing uh, a joint, uh, uh, in, in organizing joint teaching projects. In the end, these turned out to be rather secondary and very easy to bypass. And uh, especially if it was if the discussion in Germany and also from the German Academic Exchange Service with view to digital skills that have to be transfused among students. Well, to our experience, it was always right the opposite. It was the students who transfused digital skills to the lecturers uh, in order to enable them to get taught appropriately. Uh, okay, I'm not going into uh, further details because we will address 
the, the, the issue of asynchronous and synchronous approaches and planted models at the exact example in a second. I'd like to um, uh, continue for a moment with the institutional perspective. And um, while well, we started with this project in the Corona times, of course, and everyone was enthusiastic to make the best use of the unfortunate situation that we had to do teaching anyway digitally. So do it internationally was a surplus, was something that uh, uh, interested people because it was at least making it, rendering it more interesting than the uh, standard situation. But once the uh, digital emergency was over, unfortunately, it wasn't easy to convince uh, lecturers to continue with at least the international um, advantages of digital teaching. There was a rush to on-site teaching everywhere. I think that's the experience we all share. Um, there was a almost false antagonism between on-site versus virtual teaching that was always put into contrast. Uh, the permanent Zoom fatigue was an easy excuse to uh, dismiss any other proposal to uh, make use of Zoom as an integrative part in another learning setting. The resilience and the lack of innovative spirit in faculties was doing uh, its own share. And then there was the, so the usual confusion about terms like blended, hybrid, synchronous and asynchronous in teaching and learning, which was mixed up almost arbitrarily by many people who wanted simply refuse to deal further on with digital techniques. The lack of technical equipment, of course, is a problem in many situations. And I do, uh, and we of course recognize this as a problem, but the solutions which were found in, in some circumstances are usually, uh, uh, the, the, the can be, no, sorry, I got lost in my own argumentation. <laughs> the, um, the solutions that can be found for that um, can be very uh, economic as well. So for example, what we uh, went for in the uh, international office and offered to our lecturers was a very simple setting uh, that simply made use of an additional screen as something like a window for the uh, connected and linked classroom. And that was a solution that cost less than 5,000 euro. Um, and that is clearly something that can be done easily. I'm not going to the technical details, but um, what really has to be addressed are the problems that come with designing and realizing transnational teaching as a standard, as, an, as a routine uh, um, offer. And that is uh, that we have to find creative and flexible approaches to dealing with international term incongruencies and with international time differences, which ob ob objectively exist and which have to be overcome. Um, and that faculties and universities should think about incentives and appreciation for hybrid teaching by fully dig recognizing digitally teaching as part of the teaching load of uh, a lecturer. This is, for example, not the case in Germany. Um, and while sometimes we have the impression that in universities are even hesitant and, uh, uh, and, and hindering um, in transnational teaching projects, they should rather think about how to support by funds for student assistance or for uh, 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 teaching assistance um, such transnational teaching projects given their ambitious and demanding nature because pre preparing such a course can be more demanding than a standard course. So what I would plea for is the constructive integration of transnational virtual teaching into the curricula and to facilitate um, their uh, realization with all means. Of course, didactic training for hybrid or transnational teaching would help to establish standards and um, uh, to, to create um, original and attractive teaching offers beyond the international appeal. And I'd like to give one example more in concrete uh, with a case study of a recent project which I'm currently um, following up. And that is a joint teaching project in the field of history. Uh, the subject is culture of memory and public history in comparison, Germany and Japan and their uncomfortable past. 
Uh, I'm working with a partner from uh, Sofia University in Tokyo. Uh, he is running a Japanese-German comparative cultural studies program. Um, while I'm doing this for the history department um, of the University of Cologne. Um, and the, the subject of this project is a comparative approach to the public historical discourse on sensible issues of World War II experience in the two countries. Uh, in particular, we want to look at war crimes involvement from Japan and from Germany. Of course, in Germany, uh, that's mostly focused on the Holocaust. And in Japan, uh, the treatment of Korea and of Koreans during World War II would be one main issue. And the second uh, large sector that we would like to focus at is war-related forced migration experience. And that's less known in Germany that also the Japanese society had something similar to what happened to Eastern, uh, what happened to Germans from Eastern European areas, which were forced to return to uh, Western parts of Germany um, after World War II. In Japan, those Japanese forced migration, if you wish, came from Manchuria, where they had colonized um, during World, before and during World War II large sectors. And uh, the ways that has been dealt with, with these, uh, the, the societies in these two countries dealt with um, those historical experiences and basically also with shame and guilt in these uh, um, issues has been very different. And we would like to focus on that um, for the goals of this seminar is a, to uh, achieve a better understanding of the historical contexts in both cases, to exercise multi-perspectivity um, for these cases and uh, a better international contextualization. So what are the reference comparisons that can be taken and what lessons can be drawn from comparing those situations? Uh, that's a classic transnational approach that we are pleading for. Uh, that provides a sensibilization for political motivations of public history and especially the comparative approach will help uh, to um, evaluate and assess the public discourse in both countries more objectively. What are the challenges and solutions in such um, an endeavor? Uh, there's, the technical setup is easy, simple, hybridized seminar rooms, basically both sides have the same type of basic equipment, but we also want to apply and to make use of individual digital devices for breakout groups, because otherwise that would not be possible. The didactic concept is, yes, tandem taught, jointly prepared course, based on common readings and on personal, different personal national experiences. Uh, and we strictly want to maintain a transnational approach of international contextualization. But in doing so, we want to mix synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, syn uh, uh, well, we want to mix uh, common sessions with the entire group, with separate debates and preparations. Uh, so we will basically have half of the time as joint sessions and half of the time as sessions in our individual uh, national setting, if you wish. But we want to establish mixed groups for joint presentations and for joint projects so that the um, interaction between those is not only in the main sessions but also in private um, uh, preparations and private uh, project work. We have to face a time difference but that's feasible because our group starts at 10 and their group starts at 6. Uh, we have a term difference which is rather more difficult to address but we still have a substantial overlap that would suffice to organize the group work. Um, we have to think about the curricular integration and recognition. For the Japanese side, it's easy because those students are anyway part of a German and German culture group. In our case, it's a little more difficult. We have some history students, but also some selected students of Japanese culture, but they need to be qualified for a historical course like that and need to pass an interview first. Yeah, you can imagine from this setting how uh, uh, ambitious the preparation of such a, a program is in terms of content. So we will have 
a long discussion over the summer between uh, the lecturers to get that prepared correctly. But there's also an administrative framework that needs to be provided. And that is very difficult, dif different in both countries. And that is also a speaking example for um, the different approaches an institution can take to support such projects. In Cologne, unfortunately, we have no particular recognition and incentive for transnational joint teaching so far, even though we pressed hard to take that into account in future plannings. There are formal obstacles and hurdles. The term incongruencies have to be addressed almost secretly because officially no student can be forced to start a course two weeks before the official semester starts. So we really need to uh, find um, uh, ways to address this with the students. Interestingly so, the students are not really caring at all about those administrative hurdles. They are happy to join such a more special specialized course, though they will come, but it's difficult to find an official phrasing for that. The technical support is what it is, and that's the support the International Office provides. There is no support from the central units, and the curricular integration is up to the lecturers themselves. They have to find ways how to arrange for that. Uh, there is no administrative support for that either. Not to speak about financial or structural support, we have no possibility in Cologne to make a case for a little more uh, support in terms of student assistance or tutors or something like that, which would be helpful uh, because that's simply not reflected in the structures. In Tokyo, the situation is entirely different. And I discovered that when we prepared our program. They have an office that is doing a promotion for how to design collaborative online international learning uh, and um, they even do so together with two more universities in Tokyo who have defined their standards, what they expect from lecturers, the ways how they could prepare their courses and they even offer a funding program which provides to everyone who is doing such an ambitious course an additional uh, funding for a student assistant and maybe even for a mobility so that the lecturers could meet uh, for uh, a workshop together. So that is entirely different. They have the spatial promotion program encouraging lecturers to do such projects. They have a technical administrative support to realize those courses. And they even have an inter-university alliance to enhance these experiences and um, to share experiences within a local defined um, group of universities. Not to speak about the financial and structural support that comes with it. I was deeply impressed, and that's exactly what we were fighting for for months already, and they have it just like that. Great. Uh, this is from the brochure. If you have any other questions, please consult with the COIL administration office of one of the universities. If you have questions, you may consult with me, either right now or after the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes. I think you already have um, a number of questions on the chat, but you have to go, you know, back in the history of the chat. During your presentation, some questions have been asked already. Um, then I will give the floor to Vanessa, who is going to present, uh, well, uh, a different type of experience within one of the European University Alliances uh, in which the University of Montpellier is a part of. Thank you, Nicoletta. Yes, okay, so I'm going to share also um, a presentation. Sorry, then. Okay. Okay, so uh, yes, I'm going to thank you for this opportunity and uh, thank you, Johannes, also to have. Uh, introduce uh, the transnational uh, cooperation concept. It's uh, actually um, is something we are experiencing every day in the Charm EU uh, Alliance. So today I'm going to uh, present you a little bit what we have done in the first. Vanessa, time. Sorry, yeah. uh, Vanessa, you are still in present in in lect in in yeah. uh, presenters mode. Oh, thank exactly. you. Is it okay now? 
Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for noticing me. So uh, yes. So basically, um, I'm going maybe to to, um, to present at the beginning the context of this European alliance. Uh, so um, this alliance, Charme EU, started in 2019, in between five um, universities uh, at the beginning. Uh, so it's called Charm AU because it's challenge-driven, accessible, research-based, and mobile European university. This is the acronym of uh, our alliances. So it is funded by the Erasmus Plus program uh, of the European Union. And this first uh, alliance um, has seen as the founder members the University of Barcelona, the Trinity College in Dublin, Utrecht University in, U in uh, the Netherlands, Edwards Laurent University in Budapest, Hungary, and the University of Montpellier. Uh, we started in 2019 uh, with the goal of building together um, a shared uh, experience in terms of, um, of courses of university itself. So tasks, as you can imagine, are uh, a lot. How, how we did it, how we uh, tried to tackle uh, that, uh, that ambitious goal well, by uh, simply uh, splitting up all, all the tasks in different work groups, as many other alliances uh, did, and the transnational um, uh, aspects of those work groups is an important one, because we had to cooperate with uh, colleagues from other universities to understand how to, um, for example, how to uh, administrate um, shared courses in between our universities uh, to prototype, to, to disseminate, uh, to have a, a same model uh, of teaching and learning and so on. Uh, on the left side of your screen, you can, you can see uh, the, the groups, the tired groups of people meeting in those work packages. And, uh, um, and amongst all the uh, uh, all the people involved, well, we can count 300 people working on this project um, for the first four years of uh, the project itself. Um, so we split, as said, um, in different, um, in different uh, smaller um, bunch of tasks, uh, what we wanted to do together, and uh, different universities led those work groups. Uh, today we have we will have a focus on on the uh, on what two of those work groups have done uh, the the teaching and learning strategies work group uh, four and the pilot uh, work group uh, which are led by the Netherlands and uh, by by Ireland so Trinity College and Utrecht universities were the leading groups but we wanted to work um, all together in those groups so is the University of Montpellier to, today presenting you uh, the results because I was involved as well in those uh, two work packages so work package four uh, teaching and learning strategies well we started by saying okay we want to build together a European university but on what pedagogical uh, backgrounds with, with which actually um, ideas and principle and guiding questions so we met um, we met many times to uh, check together what we wanted, which were our pedagogical ingredients to our modules. Um, and uh, those are the 10 uh, principles we are applying when we do build together uh, courses, module, bachelor's, master's in the Alliance. So uh, basically all uh, our teaching and learning activities are um, based on the challenge-based methodologies, uh, which uh, actually, as uh, Francois um, told us uh, before by the project uh, management uh, that is involved in the Minecraft uh, module, for example, well, uh, transversal skills are very much um, activated in, in this uh, uh, specific way of uh, teaching. So uh, challenge base is one uh, is the main principle. Then we do have a lot of connection in our university with researchers. Um, we do have uh, a research based uh, approach um, also to the challenge based. We do have the principle of sustainability, technology enhanced, 
um, student-centered, situated learning uh, because of um, the needs of understanding how to apply different concepts in, in the real world. Let's say that transverse thought skills are often uh, very uh, solicited as well. Um, transdisciplinarity is one of the principal transnational and intercultural experiences and activities um, are one uh, is one actually of our principle as well and inclusivity. Um, so uh, with those principles, we started to buy, uh, to build our first pilot, which is a master made up of three semester. The master title is Global Challenges in Sustainability. And um, it's made of three different semester, uh, a preparatory phase, um, a flexible phase where students can actually choose uh, in between three different potential tracks, life and health, water and food, and then a capstone phase where students have to develop with external stakeholders um, a project. Uh, so um, those um, uh, the master runs in our five um, universities uh, synchronously at the same time in a specific environment we had to make uh, to run it. Um, so, yeah. So I'm specifically member of, of um, the team that, uh, that was in charge of building this, um, this teaching and learning environment in connection with uh, the teaching staff that actually was designing uh, the, the different models and their contents. So um, basically we tackle that, that, um, that goal by saying, well, we do need uh, to, to work in um, transnational cooperative teams. Uh, so the first team that we activated was the research team. What we want to, what we do need based on uh, what the teachers said us they, they, they are going to do um, well, we do have different scenarios that can that we can activate. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, that international team was in charge of understanding by um, interviewing, by making some focus group, by understanding uh, both the teach, teaching staff and the administrative uh, parts of our universities, um, which were the, the main scenarios we wanted to, uh, to realize. Uh, then um, we actually activated the second team, so the hybrid classroom build team, and there is another team in here that is missing on the slide, the VLE, so the virtual learning environment uh, team as well. We built together a, a, a teaching and learning environment, which was modular enough um, uh, to um, actually uh, to, 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 to make all the different activities and different uh, workshops that were planned. Um, and which is articulated in two um, parts. We will see them later, a virtual one and a physical one. So hybrid classroom built team was in charge of that. In, in the matrix there, you can see um, uh, the different uh, roles in uh, these environments and uh, how we can, uh, we, we should change uh, or, or which technology we do need to uh, allow the different uh, roles, the different, um, persons that are using the environment itself um, uh, to, 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 to practice, to be able uh, of, uh, of running those. And then uh, actually we built, we, we eventually built those hybrid classroom. And in the, in the last part of the slide, you can see the five hybrid classrooms connected in between them. So there's the Montpellier one uh, with me in the classroom. Then we do have a Dublin one, uh, with Daniel Griffin, the Barcelona in the middle. Um, down on the right, there's the LTA hybrid classroom and on the left, the Utrecht uh, University hybrid classroom, all connected. Okay, so, well, as said, uh, the research team, um, but the three teams actually used a, a participatory action research methodology to better understand and develop what we wanted to. So for us, it was very important to understand all perspectives uh, and that you have an active particip participation of all the actors. Um, so basically, um, uh, our, our main uh, interaction 
connection where we, with the KCT network, KCT in China EU stays for knowledge creating teams networks, basically um, groups of uh, um, researchers, teachers and educationalists in our universities. Uh, then we run a lot of team meetings and sharing session in uh, um, a transnational uh, group uh, in between uh, our university, we asked for one, at least one member of each university to better understand uh, strengths and weaknesses and needs, as Johanna said before, uh, well, uh, as we have seen in the, in the example of Germany uh, and Japan, uh, Japan uh, different approaches, well, we noticed the same, uh, the, the, the issues um, that um, Utrecht University is facing more uh, are very different from the ones that you can find in Budapest. Uh, so this actually is basically the technology, uh, the, the methodology we used uh, to better understand what we needed and uh, to develop our model. So here it is, the wonderful uh, hybrid classroom and virtual learning environment, the, 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 the wonderful environment we, we we eventually end up uh, to realize. Uh, so Charme, you provided to the ma master pilot um, the teaching and learning environment made up of the hybrid classroom, so the physical space, and made up of a virtual learning environment, uh, which is made of different, let's say, layers of application. We do have some core platform, which are the the, the the most used one. Uh, so we basically use Moodle uh, for as a repositories and also platform uh, for uh, the, the teaching and learning um, semesters. We do uh, use Teams for, to connect and we do have an e-portfolio uh, in use for our um, uh, master. Uh, then we provided to the teaching staff, to, to, to our teaching staff, also some flexible applications um, with, the goal to, to, with the goal to help them uh, improving the in interactivity. Uh, as said, we do have five uh, different um, universities involved. And we noticed, we realized the teacher cannot be in the five classroom at the same time. So we wanted to uh, make somehow um, the activities more interactive and we provided for that uh, a bunch of flexible applications that came from our uh, universities. And then some emerging technologies uh, were added to that. We'll see them uh, later. Students ha have uh, also to bring their personal computer and their earpods to, to the classroom. So the hybrid classroom equipment, um, basically uh, based on uh, different activities, we real, well, in challenge-based learning, often you have, you split up your classroom in uh, smaller groups and you uh, throw them a challenge to solve with, uh, with some guiding question and so on. So we needed a space that was mo modular enough to split um, to split the class in uh, smaller local groups, but also at the same time, we needed them to, to have the possibility to be connected uh, with the other, with their peers uh, that, uh, that are, were situated in other hybrid classrooms. This is why we invented pods. Pods are basically uh, stations with, with a screen, uh, a camera and the speakers. Um, where students actually can launch a meeting in between different hybrid classrooms, for example, when they are split in smaller groups, or uh, they can connect uh, with, the, with the main uh, lecture at the same time to see uh, the teacher close it, to be seen from the teacher uh, in a closer perspective, because those um, pods have cameras, uh, so the teacher can have a clearer perception of uh, who's in the room. Uh, and so on. This is why we invented uh, the pods. <laughs> um, so, um, and then we added to our classroom, this was a, a Budapest addition that, that, that actually we, we loved uh, and uh, we, we practiced, we, we managed to, uh, to integrate uh, the cozy corner, as Nicoletta said at the beginning, formal and informal um, spaces and moments are equally important. 
uh, in the learning experience. And uh, so uh, we tried to make our classroom um, with the, the opportunity to, to, to have those informal moments. Uh, in our classroom, we do have uh, corners with um, uh, small sofas and uh, which are hided from the cameras as well so that students can have their uh, own moments uh, over there. Uh, yeah. Uh, so those are the scenarios we are using in CharmEU uh, Master Pilot. Uh, so sometimes we do have all the five hybrid classroom activated is in, as in the one main classroom scenario and five classroom scenarios. Uh, the teacher can be, uh, as in the one main classroom scenario, in one of our universities and then uh, students are connected in the others uh, in the others institution. In the five classroom scenario, which is the one of the most used at the moment, we do have uh, the teacher. In this case, is in TCD. It has a, um, a yellow um, circle around. Um, the teacher is in one of the hybrid classroom and is helped by the teaching assistant that are in class in the other hybrid classroom. The, the role of the teaching assistant is um, to facilitate the sessions, uh, to mirror the teacher if needed, and to be the person um, on charge locally um, for uh, during the activities uh, uh, in, in the classroom. Uh, then we do have the, the just one classroom scenario that we are trying to avoid <laughs> as, um, as much as possible, because actually we noticed that well, the teaching and learning experience is very difficult to organize in that way for the teaching staff and gives uh, to students um, a really different perception um, of, uh, of the contents and the activity itself. So uh, on the bottom line, you can see some of um, uh, some pictures of actual activities with the involvement of the pod. Uh, so the teacher in the main screen, for example, in, uh, in a meeting with that specific group of students and so on. Um, yes, the importance of uh, actually um, uh, go outside of the classroom as well. So our, um, one of our principles is uh, also the situated learning. So we try as soon as possible to break as uh, yeah, as often as possible to break the um, the barriers of uh, of the walls, <laughs> and basically we try to design our module our courses also with mobility activities in it. Um, in this example, we had one week um, in Montpellier where a group uh, of students during the second semester, so the group that was on on the food. Uh, track during the second semester, they all came in Montpellier and we didn't stay in the classroom a minute. We went out visiting uh, uh, external stakeholders, visit, visiting uh, specific uh, examples of uh, what they were st studying, so sustainability in the food system. Um, yes, and this is also is a blended intensive program of Erasmus that we manage uh, to, to include in, uh, in quite every track during the second semester. And at the same time, technology as, as a potential um, wall breaker, uh, as Francois uh, showed us, you can go in virtual worlds. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a way to break those barriers. Uh, also, another way is um, to um, to rely or to prepare uh, some uh, experiences that are, for example, in this example, guided with an app. Uh, this uh, this application that comes from Utrecht, basically geolocalized students, uh, is a geolocalized application where students can walk around the city uh, to be, have a better understanding of uh, the SDGs. Um, and uh, yeah, and helped uh, improve actually the situated learning and also some physical activities <laughs> of the students around the city that they they were uh, living in. 
So yeah, that's mainly all for Charming You. Maybe can be interesting to know that we are building a toolkit and uh, this toolkit is online with all uh, the documents on our experience, uh, all our uh, know-how till now. And on this toolkit, there's a, a hybrid classroom handbook that explains more in details how we built it and um, actually presents also some interesting um, ways of uh, redesigning uh, the face-to-face uh, the, the -face courses. I've seen a comment in, in the chat, which was very interesting uh, on it, uh, how is time consuming actually to, um, to make our, uh, let's say classical courses hybrid. So um, I think that professional development should, will be one of the next goals of our alliance um, because it's clearly uh, one of the main points uh, to, 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 to better um, converge uh, in a similar way of teaching uh, and learning in our universities. So um, our lesson learned, our evolution for the future, well, we will um, look for more integration of our educational principle in, in uh, our pilots, um, into the design of our master and future modules we are building together in the Alliance. Um, then physical build alignment across the Alliance, as said before, um, the, the weaknesses and the difficulties you can find in Montpellier are different from Trinity's one. So to keep an eye of this balance is very important to us. An emphasis, uh, emphasis on professional development is uh, also one of the main point. And then, um, well, time for testing, staff orientation, uh, more in-class local activities. This is something that students uh, often ask us. Um, and, enhance more uh, the, the, the experience with emerging technologies is also one of our uh, goals, as well as to make all that uh, sustainable in terms of uh, budget uh, and, and, and stabilize that, mas that pilot masters in our institution. Okay, that's it. If you have questions, do not hesitate. I think you have some comments and questions on, on the chat, Vanessa. Great. So uh, I will start giving the floor to Francois back to the first presentation in our panel session uh, so that you can have a bit of time to have a look on the questions and prepare a bit the answers. We do not have much time, unfortunately, but I'm really sure the audience enjoyed all the three presentations. They are uh, different, but also uh, in a in a in a way similar cases of uh, how to build use and uh, evaluate hybrid and virtual learning spaces even more maybe environments instead of spaces so francois uh, if you have anything uh, to add to the uh, questions already you already i think wrote back to some of the colleagues from the audience but if you have anything else to add, please. No, I don't think I have so too many to add. I think there was an open question about the effectivity of uh, introducing tape recorder, CD, frequency camera. Of course, yeah, it's the, the so called old technology. A, yes, some, something called old technology. For me, it's not a problem. Uh, yeah. It's, of course, possible to have some older technology, but it's not it's not very complex to have them uh, we want we wanted to focus on more recent one in our presentation that's why we only present recent ones and uh, i see that someone will write an email concerning licenses so no, don't worry you can also write emails uh, to all of us to ask questions of course if you have any any questions about that or about anything, but otherwise I think I already and uh, respond to all the other questions. So I Thank let you. the floor to Johannes. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Well, I'm uh, happy to have answer some of the questions in the uh, chat. 
Um, the first question was on how student dispositions change over time in a collaborative online um, internet learning setting. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, it's very interesting to see how um, students how an international classroom evolves during um, uh, a course, um, given that, of course, the international situation is somehow shying people in the beginning. And it always takes some time uh, to, to, to get the thing going. And onboarding is really a big issue in any type of digitally based uh, teaching. It has been an issue even with homogeneous classrooms uh, in, in Corona times, as we all know, and it is even more so a difficult issue uh, if you have a mixed classroom and especially in a hybrid setting where there's one on-site classroom and another on-site classroom. I guess Vanessa can tell us a lot about these issues uh, with even five classrooms to be interconnected, which uh, makes the thing even potentially more com uh, complex. Um, so uh, what we try to do is to start very early on to mix groups and to split groups into smaller groups and to uh, basically uh, force them, oblige them to communicate because otherwise it doesn't work. If you wait until they communicate, you may have the luck that there are two or three communicative people who do the talking and the others will remain silent. Um, so that is always uh, an issue to get started, but once it gets started and once they start also to interact um, beyond the, 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 the sessions, uh, we usually have a, a, a real exponential increase both in communication and, of, and in output and in reactions and in testimonials. Uh, all the courses have been very successful in getting the groups formed as real working groups, as interacting and as well interacting interactingly learning from each other in, in ways that I haven't encountered in, 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 in standard groups uh, before. That's always really sensational. Um, another question was on how the uh, faculty work uh, within Tandem taught and, and that is equally uh, impressive and I remember one of the first um, projects which I, I um, uh, coordinated and, and, and accompanied and the lecturer always told me, well, I'm, I'm so excited to work with that more or less renowned and famous partner from another university. And I feel so, so unprepared. And I always prepare very eagerly for the sessions. But in the end, they discovered that also the other person, the other lecturer, who presumably would have been even more experienced in teaching, had the same um, feeling and was far better prepared for each session than he would do uh, in, in other cases. In, in the end, they both um, deduct, uh, um, decide, agreed that they would have, be, have been learning at least as much as the students in these courses and that they terribly enjoyed doing that course, even if it was more ambitious, for the simple reason that the reward for the lecture was much higher than uh, in standard courses where you may fall into routine. So uh, that's another aspect that also lecturers can benefit from that situation in, in a very positive way. Uh, then there was the question of the shift from bus face to face. Focus on Oh, I don't really understand the question if it was addressed to me, uh, the difference in time and effort. Well, maybe I, I hand over to Vanessa for, for uh, a second round but before maybe I, I pick up another question. Vanessa, please. Okay, yes, no problem. So I was reading about a question on Moodle uh, Open Educational Resources. So uh, the focus on that, the idea for us in China U, for example, was to have this, uh, to, to use open source um, uh, uh, softwares and, and platforms. Uh, because of the scalability of that, the, the potential, and also the inclusivity and so on. But it's, um, it's a difficult pro process sometimes, uh, a little bit uh, long, and, uh, and uh, it depends a lot on the different rules um, of, uh, of different institutions, if you can or cannot uh, use those. Um, uh, yes. So that I don't know if it answered the question. For example, I was thinking about portable application. Yes, um, without the loaded down hardware, we we haven't 
um, at the moment uh, yet explored that uh, opportunity, but I think can be an interesting path for, for the future. It's true that to organize um, uh, or to make decision in such larger group with different rules and regulations uh, sometimes uh, takes more time than expected. So yeah, uh, this is on process. Then about um, about the doctoral students, uh, yes, they, they are they will be included in in uh, in our upcoming project, which is called Charm Eight. Even if we are nine, but this is because we had a, a last university joining uh, really last minute. But yes, uh, doctoral students are included in our plans. Uh, the the idea is to connect. Uh, also to their research and um, um, and specific disciplines uh, with our approach. I don't know. Well, in often it is not so sexy to have a career into into, into uh, institute in more into the teaching uh, part. Let's say that. So we are trying to find a way to connect more the research and the teaching path in uh, in Charme U to um, to have more um, doctoral uh, potential parts in it. Okay, then I think, uh, Johannes, would you like to add something? Yeah, I'd like to answer ask your question. Yeah. I would like to, uh, to, to have a question to Vanessa. Um, I was wondering about the cozy corner, apart from the fact that I was wondering that it's exactly the, 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 the Hungarians who came up with it, which was kind of a surprise. But uh, what is more, how does it work, an intercultural experience in a cozy corner, if that is a physical place? Um, and how is it connected to the other classrooms? And it, because otherwise, it won't be an intercultural uh, experience. So I presume there is some interconnection between the cozy corners then. Uh, not yet, not really into the cozy corner, but the cozy corner is, yeah. So the interesting part is that all uh, the technological expertise came from uh, Utrecht mainly in the hybrid classroom teams and all uh, that let's say informal part of how to build a classroom came from uh, mainly from Budapest. I love that that, uh, that uh, different balance and uh, so the cozy corners yes are connected but when they want so basically the students can bring their own laptops in the cozy corner when they want to for example join with other team members in the other hybrid classroom um, it's often you as a, as a pose corner, as an informal, where they do have, when they do have um, teams um, issues, let's say that, they often go there to discuss. I haven't understood why, but probably it's because it's cozy, so they feel uh, welcomed and free to say whatever, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, still under um, experimentation, let's say that. Uh, I will come with more on that because I'm curious to, to better understand how to develop the, the cozy corner. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I think we are uh, a bit out of the time uh, allocated to the webinar. So on behalf of the three uh, colleagues presenting very inspiring, hopefully, case studies from uh, Coimbra Group Universities, Francois Lesselier, Johannes Müller, and Vanessa Vigano, thank you all for uh, all the attention, for all the interesting comments and questions. Hope you will be so interested in our work that you will visit very soon um, the website of the Coimbra Group and more specifically, the part of the Education Innovation Working Group, uh, the um, uh, high-level uh, policy seminar in education is uh, detailed on the website, and you can also find uh, all the list of case studies presenting during that event. A very good afternoon to you all. Thank you again, Francois, Johannes, and Vanessa. Really inspiring. We will keep up the good work together. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.